And welcome back, guys, to another Gutter Fighting Secrets Tactical Podcast with your host, me, Will Sherlin. We are joined by a special guest today, Ace from Delta 2 Alpha Design. That's Delta 2 Alpha Design on Instagram, YouTube, and his website is Delta and the number 2 Alpha. Dot com. All of his links, respectively, are going to be thrown down here in the description. So Ace is a really cool guy. He's kind of a jack of all trades. Ace, I know that you sell knives. You sell textile type things. You've got some really cool stuff on your website, bro. And I'm not trying to make this a commercial, but you've got um, some like a Shamag Keeper, which I thought was cool. You've got a charging bracelet on there. You've got the Pack Rat Soft SOF shell. And we'll get into all of this, man. But I just want to make the point for the listeners that you kind of are a jack of all trades, man. Not only do you sell really awesome tactical gear, you also do a, pa- a podcast. Um, and that is the Monks and um, Monks and is it the Monks and Marauders? Monks and Mavericks. Monks and Mavericks uh, podcast, which I was actually fortunate enough to be on the other day. And so thank you for having me on, bro. And besides from that, you also do like training videos and stuff. I know that you've got the um, El Russo Fugitive Fitness, which is something that's pretty cool. You were saying that, look, if you don't have time to get to a gym or if you're on the road, like a lot of guys in the EP industry might find themselves doing or merchant marine or whatever, you know, no bad kind of lifestyle you lead, you don't always have a gym right in front of you. So learning to work with body weight and bands and stuff is pretty cool too. And not only do you do all that, man, I'm going to just keep rolling here. You also are a a highly accomplished martial artist. You've been doing BJJ and wrestling for years and years and years. You uh, started with Bujikan, which is ninjutsu. You study a plethora of other arts out there. At least you're acquainted with them like Wing Chun. So Bro, like you've got a very accomplished resume here. Um, I want to kind of cut to it and say welcome to the podcast, Ace. Thanks for coming on. And um, how are you, bro? Thanks for having me. Um, Yeah, Jack Jack of all trades, uh, master of none. Um, And the way that I've been able to learn that stuff is just through various projects, kind of self-directed education. uh, um, Whether it's textiles or learning to take somebody down or striking or whatever it is, I uh, get interested in it and I become uh, more or less obsessed about it until I uh, understand it. Well, you're one of those highly motivated individuals that I talk a lot about on, on our channel here at Gutter Fighting Secrets. Um, some guys are kind of content to skate through life, do their nine to five and uh, come home, drink beers and watch TV. But most of our viewers, I think, uh, fall into the category of highly motivated individuals that want to learn, want to train, want to get better at, you know, everything that comes along with that title of being a warrior. So you're definitely one of them. You're one of the more self-motivated people that I know, but that's exactly how you need to be, you know, when it comes to uh, being a wandering samurai, so to speak, right? I, uh, yeah, I guess so. Um, one, one of the things that, that, that I always try to keep in mind is like, for me, I, I do the stuff that I do because I enjoy it. Um, and if somebody enjoys cheering for the local sports team uh, and talking about who sports to better last time and how they could sports better in the future, or they didn't sports hard enough. That that's cool. There, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Like the right the the dick of my hobby is not bigger than the dick of theirs, and they have a lot more downtime. And as long as they're happy, I mean, like do do whatever you want, you know. No, kind of, kind of live, live and let live. I, uh, I don't yeah. think that I'm any better than anyone because I have different interests. Well, again, spoken like a true samurai, to be honest with you, man, because, you know, it, guys like you truly don't think that they're any better than anybody else. And I'm not saying you are, uh, but I'm also uh, putting it out there on a limb that kind of I know you've got a lot of things on your plate at any given time. And it really takes kind of a different breed of individual to accomplish everything that you're doing. A lot of guys out there, probably including myself, you know, if we've got too many projects on the burner at once, we rarely accomplish, you know, even one, let alone two or three of them at a time. 
That uh, m- uh, managing burnout definitely is definitely is a strong side of it. Um, during the pandemic, I took on uh, took on a little more than I uh, I should have, and am just starting to kind of work my way out of that hole now. Uh, I was doing all the D two A craziness that I uh, I normally do, and decided you know what I'm going to go through and build a basement suite and buy a house and uh, or buy a house and build a basement suite in it um, during the middle of a pandemic and do it all myself so uh, while, while, while working uh, 48 to 60 hours a week at a, uh, at my Bruce Wayne job. I like how you call it your Bruce Wayne job. Uh, you really, <laughs> you really are a lot like Bruce Wayne because I don't even know if you sleep much, man. Like it, it seems like every time I talk to you, you're coming off of a, you know, a long night and then you're up early and your Adam, it's, um, it's impressive to see everything that you kind of get done. Uh, and, and just keep rolling with it, man. Now I want to ask this question and I want to throw it out to you. What do you make of this pandemic, man? I mean, I'm just gonna, I'm going to straight up ask you, do you think this freaking thing came from a lab? Do you think it was on purpose? Do you think it was an accident? Did it come from a bat? Like what is ACE's perspective of what's going on right now? Uh, so I'd like to start out with that. I don't, I don't attribute to conspiracy what can be uh, explained away with incompetence. Um, and we wind up seeing a lot of stuff where people are, po- politicians are in the business of doing what? Their interest right, is in right. getting reelected. Right. Right. So initially what happened is we, uh, we as a society, uh, as as a society basically said, hey, we, we don't know what the heck is going on. Um, this is the information that we have um, in which the accuracy of said information is, can be called in question. Here's the information we have. And we're going to go through and take these measures based on the information that we have. All right. So you had your, you know, your per case per 100,000 people. Uh, quotas and all that set. And so we, we defined what these numbers are. And as a thing progressed um, and we shut down economies, you go through and you look at like some economies like, you know, Pakistan, Pakistan probably saw a loss in GDP in 2020 of 40%. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and so you wound up seeing a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of working class folks getting the screws put to them. A um, bunch of small business owners wound up uh, having to shut their doors because of the things that were put into place. And honestly, like it's, it's tragic, right? I, uh, I know some of them that, uh, that have, that, that have been affected and my, uh, my heart goes out to them. I wish I could do more. And so when you go through and you take uh, j- businesses that have been in families for multiple generations and because of, uh, policy that was put out, those businesses go under. If it wasn't for a good reason and they were forced to do these things because it was mandated, where's the liability? And I think that a lot of it is we're going through and we're doubling down on on policy because we need to keep, we, we need to keep towing this line. We keep going, going by this thing, even though uh, there's evidence to suggest that maybe we don't need to do that, but we need to go through and continue to tow this line because otherwise we have to admit that we're wrong. And based on how some people have been affected, I mean, there's, there is real conversations about people getting tarred and feathered out there, yeah. real conversations. And so now what do we do, right? Because there's a there's a giant quagmire that we're looking at. And so if I had made a giant, if I had made a fuck up, pardon my language, if I if if I had gone through and made a mistake, I myself as as an adult and as as a man as kind of a my my personal code, I got to come out and own it. I got to come out and say, hey. We shot from the hip, right? We we had to go through, do this thing because that's this is we did based on the information that we have. And you know what? Uh, we maybe overreacted. So let's find a way that we can manage this. Um, if you want to go to work, go to work. 
Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to have your business open, have your business open and we'll kind of let the market decide as far as what is valuable and what isn't. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll go through and do what we can to kind of uh, modify that, you know, like um, whether masks work or not is, uh, is kind of up for debate. If you're, uh, if you're, if you're in a control room or you're in a, uh, in a car or a truck with a guy and, uh, and he starts busting ass and through his underwear, through his jeans and through his coveralls, you're still smelling it. What's the surgical mask going to do? Right. Um, just a, uh, a quick bit of old timey knowledge. If you want to do, if you want to check to see if your mask is working, this comes from respirators and gas masks, put it on and spray some air freshener or some cologne or something like that in the air. If you can smell it, your mask isn't filtering. Your mask is not stopping it. Good tip. Right. Like, like, so if, if you can go through and put your mask on, right, your COVID mask on and spray pledge in the air, your wife's perfume or room spray, and you smell and you give a big whiff and you can smell it, it's not filtering. And those, and the particulate of that is considerably larger than what a virus is. Um, so whatever, whatever policies were put in place, they needed to walk them back. And when we go through and we look at the things that were clamped down on, like I said, the, we, it was just kind of like, well, like we, we got to shut it all down because we didn't know. But there's certain things that we do know, like healthy people tend to survive diseases better than non-healthy people, by and large. Um, so going through and clamping down on gyms, um, I don't think that you should make people go to places they don't want to be, right? Like, hey, if you don't want to go to jujitsu because you think that there's a risk of you getting sick, uh, don't don't go. But if these other people do want to go, cool. If you don't want to leave your house and you want to, um, you know, you you want to sit at home and uh, and collect the uh, the government dole, uh, and sure, right? Like that's on you. You want to wear a mask? You want to wear a respirator or something like that? Go for it. But there's, as we've seen that the the effects, right? The world's most deadly disease. Um, is being combated with pieces of cloth and uh, neck gaiters versus what a real, I mean, your, your background, my background, we know what a hazmat suit looks like. Yeah. We know what NBC gear looks like. So if we're going, if this thing's so deadly, we're protecting against it with a piece of cloth. Does it make sense? Um, and so I, I think that it was just bad policy and we had to keep doubling down on it because we set our numbers at, you know, a thousand per hundred thousand or things like that. The other thing coming out of it is I, I think that human beings are, are really bad at understanding numbers past a certain point. Mm. So when we go through and we say, you know, uh, I can use the stats in, in Canada cause it's more relevant to me and I hear them more, but if we go through and say, you know, 5,000 people in Ontario are going to die from COVID. Okay. Well, let's say that's true. There's 15 million people in Ontario. So we are looking at not as much as we think, right? So if that was, right, if if, if it was 5,000 to 5 million, right, that is like, one in 10,000 mm-hmm. or sorry, one, one in a thousand. So we're looking at three in 10,000, three in 10,000 people might die. Well, it doesn't really seem like that big of a deal. And I mean, don't, don't kid me. Or, sorry, let's not kid ourselves for anyone that dies. It is a tragedy for their family. Right. Unfortunately, life is the most terminal disease of all. The only thing that we know in life is that we will die and we will pay taxes. That's the only thing that we know. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And um, you bring up a a good point here about Canada. And uh, I think a lot of our viewers are aware, especially, you know, my Instagram viewers are aware that Canada, certain provinces, or for us dumbass Americans, certain states, if you will, in Canada are really kind of experiencing more totalitarianism than others. But 
overall, I think from what I've been hearing from the information I've been gathering in Canada right now, there's kind of a problem. There's kind of an issue with government overreach going on. Um, what can you tell us about what's happening on the ground in Canada as far as the police state goes right now? It varies heavily from region to region. Um, so uh, where, where I am in, uh, in Alberta, it is considerably more relaxed um, in kind of the, uh, the prairie in the western, uh, western part of Canada. Sure. Um, Ontario and, uh, and Quebec is where you're seeing the, uh, seeing the, the, the tighter restrictions. And there was actually, a, I don't know if you call it an injunction or, or something, but a, a, a legal action that has been filed by roughly 15 police officers, both current and former, um, and, and taking it to court and saying, like, your act, like, our oath is to uphold the Constitution and to serve the community. And we're not doing that when we're telling a, you know, a mother of five that she can't, she can't run her family business that allows her to support her family. Yeah. Because $2,000 a month, especially there, $2,000 a month will not feed your, it won't, it'll barely feed your family. Mm -hmm. Give you an idea in the area where that case is to get a house, you're looking about a million bucks. Mm -hmm. Right. So they're, the, the guys that are the pointy end of the stick are, are kind of saying, well, like, this isn't what we signed up for, right? And that, that I, I would suggest gives hope because there is, you can't enforce, you can't enforce a policy that nobody's willing to enforce. Correct. And when you're starting to get, uh, you're starting to get pushback from guys who are, who were like, I, I didn't go into this put, to put a to put a chunk on my hip and a tin on my chest and push people around. Yeah, I went into this because a I wanted a good pension and benefits. Right, I mean let's let's be real about it. I want a good pension and benefits, but I also want to go through and serve my community. There's a certain amount of that. You know, unlike firefighters, we basically just want to eat till you're tired and sleep till you're bored. Sleep is the best part. Well, I mean, really, like sleep, like a like a, a temperature controlled sleep pod would <laughs> yeah. make would make my night shifts way better, but way better. Yeah. Well, in all fairness, that's when we actually get to sleep. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Exactly. But, yeah, um, you you nailed it. You nailed it on the head right there, man. Is that there's a lot of pushback going on right now, both in Canada and in the states, um, by cops saying, you know what, we were not. We were not signing up for this and we're not going to be your Gestapo. We're not going to do that. And I don't mean to kind of use that dramatic term, but at a certain point, you kind of have to think, hey, what is the difference between a Stasi or a Gestapo here? Um, you know, and, and what's going on right now? Obviously, you know, thank God no one's getting killed right now by, you know, the, the, the agents of the state. Um, but you know, you really have to kind of draw the line in the sand at some point and say, hey, I'm not going to do this. This is illegal what you're asking me to do, and I will not do it. I think part of the realization comes from, like, you don't typically see law enforcement families. And by that, I mean, mom and dad both do law enforcement. Right. So you have a guy who's working, you know, say Toronto Metro or wherever, and he's going out there. But because of the policies he's helping to enforce, his kids aren't going to school. Yeah. So that means that his wife that can't go to work, who's been at home with his kids, which he knows are terrors, mm -hmm. when he comes home, guess what? It's not a happy place. Yeah. And when we're, we're basically looking at, you know, cabin fever that's extended more than a year. So there's certain psychological uh, issues that come along with that. Um, the, uh, the, the stat that you want to look at for, for tracking COVID, the big one is all cause mortality. How many people died in 2020 versus 2019 versus 2018? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then go through and look at, uh, how many died of overdoses and how many died of suicides. Yeah. 
because talking to guys that are at the pointy end of the stick, you're seeing lots of suicide and attempted suicide and uh, guys in uh, on your side of the uh, your side of the fence that are responding to. Well, they're they're almost running out of Narcan, right? Yeah. Like yeah. like like Narcan stock probably went up, you know, 20 <laughs> percent. Yeah, for sure. No, there's a lot of that going on right now. Uh, Is that Pfizer that makes that? Who makes Narcan? You know, I don't, I don't know offhand. I was actually, while you were saying that, just about to look it up. <laughs> <You're probably laughs> right. Um, but yeah, no, it's, you know, I actually was going through my security recertification the other day. Uh, I have to do it every two years to maintain a credential. And the guy was saying, look, you know, everyone out there is fucking COVID crazy right now. You can't turn your back for a second. You really can't let your guard down. And it's so true. You know, not only do we have now, as a result of all of these lockdowns, cabin fever. We've got civil unrest. We've also got geopolitical instability. Uh, We've also got supply chain issues, right? The list goes on. But really kind of a lot of what this stems from is all the mandatory shutdowns of the factories, you know, stay at home, work from home, all of this, which brings up a whole plethora of other issues. You know, guys are used to going out. Girls are used to going out, going to the office, doing whatever, uh, doing their nine to five routine. You know, on top of that, you know, on the weekends, whatever, at night, going to the bar, relaxing, this and that, concerts. There's nothing really as an outlet right now to get you out of the house and get you out of your own mind. If you're sitting on, even if you're a, a white collar type sitting on Zoom all the time, you're still stuck in the same room of the same house. It's so psychological, psychologically damaging. And I'm glad you brought that up because it's so true. And I don't really know. What the out is here, it seems to me like guys like you and what you've been doing on the YouTube channel and Instagram and all of your social media platforms, man, as far as teaching guys and girls kind of the way of the warrior is so prevalent now. And I know I was listening to your um, podcast and you had a guy named Brother Moses on, which fascinating, fascinating topic by the way about that, that was that was probably intellectually the most challenging interview i've done <laughs> i can imagine it was you know i only listened to the first quarter of it i actually want to go back and finish it but it was dude it was fascinating what that guy does man you don't you don't get a lot of that on podcasts you know the spirituality the mumbo jumbo stuff but um he brought up a, a good point was that he felt as well that he was kind of lost. He didn't know kind of where his direction was going, but after all of this stuff kind of started, man, it, it all makes sense. The trajectory of a lot of our lives right now. Right. One of the, uh, one of the big things that we're trying to focus on in this year is teaching people skills and whether that's uh, how, how do you go through and, Right, you, you have carbon steel. You want you want a knife not to rust away. Um, you can't keep oiling it. You got to use it. How can I go through and and blew it essentially at home? Right, force a patina. Um, and so, just quick background: um, when you have iron or you have steels, um, rust is iron oxide. But there's different oxides of iron. Uh, magnetite is another one. So a patina is where we force an oxide that isn't rust that creates a protective layer to prevent rust from being able to kind of take hold. So we went through and showed some videos, right? Like, okay, we'll put out a, we'll put out a knife chassis and we're going to use that knife chassis as a way to show people how to mod, uh, mod a knife, right? Okay. Here's how you go through and do that. Spoiler alert. You have carbon steel, you got it rusting and it could be, could be a hammer, could be a saw, whatever, right? You go through and you're, fashion a blade out of something. Um, if you boil it in vinegar for about five to 10 minutes, uh, after you've gone through and ground it, it'll go through and make it a really dark gray and just go through and, uh, spray some Windex or something on it after to neutralize the vinegar, uh, after you've rinsed it off and then just put a little bit of oil on it. And I mean, you literally could use butter, right? You could use canola oil. Nobody cares. So, you go through and you do that. Well, now you have that blade and it's been dark and it's protected from rust going through and showing, okay, here's some different ways to wrap a handle. Uh, we have some stuff coming up on how to make sheaths and stuff like that. Um, 
and a bunch of other things. And we're really trying to go through and show people skills. I want to show somebody skills because um, nothing helps deal with fear like increasing your level of competence. Yes. Right. So if you're you're afraid about, you know, getting beat up or violence, well, going through and training in something that uh, that addresses that will make you more confident. Um, and so going through and being right and uh, kind of upping our emphasis on physical fitness, we were doing home fitness stuff and the fugitive fitness stuff, you know, starting 2018. Um, and so the El Russo program, I gave away probably a hundred copies or more just in 2020. Um, and it was one of those things where it didn't matter if you were, my dad was COBD called uh, cardiopulmonary obstructive disorder, um, or you were, uh, you're a competitive grappler. The El Russo program would work for you because of the way that it scaled. Mm -hmm. Now that was already set up. There was guys that, uh, that ran the El Russo program during the pandemic. And they messaged me like three months later, like, man, I lost 40 pounds and I've never felt better. They're like, like my shoulder pain's gone, my neck pain's gone and all that. And there's something in there that we call postural reset, which is your kind of rehab prehab. In short, if you have shoulder pain or neck pain, it's typically because you have a, a weakness or a muscular imbalance and your upper back. If you strengthen your upper back, your rhomboids, your rear delt, mm -hmm. um, by going through and doing that, you can go through and kind of correct a lot of it. So we had, we had guys who were, who by, by kind of a little bit of our motivation or, or whichever, we were able to kind of have them going through the pandemic and building a better, better version of themselves. My big, my big beef with focusing on uh, the conspiracy side of what's going on with COVID is it doesn't make you better. Yeah. Um, as soon as we go through and we start prescribing to conspiracy and using that as the default reason, we've more or less given up. We've said, I'm saying, well, you know what? It's not my fault. <laughs> you know, so I'm just going to go through and drink a flat of Lucky Lager and eat some KFC every night <laughs> and binge watch, you know, through your favorite propaganda outlet on Netflix or prime or wherever. And I'm just going to go through and be told what to think as I do nothing, but wear my body down and feel my, and feel myself on shit food. Mm -hmm. Or, or I can go through and be like, well, I have, I've never had the opportunity to learn more than I do right now. Well put, well put. Right. And the, the amount of stuff you can learn for free off of YouTube like, forget about it, man. The college right, like, YouTube, man, is what I call it. Like, you can you can go through and learn lots of information, and you can trial and error and make all the mistakes and figure, figure a lot of stuff out. And so you could, you could choose what kind of the lockdowns is a lockdown, and you could choose to view it as a sabbatical. And that mindset matters, right? One of my... One of my favorite quotes, I don't know who said it originally. It was one of my bosses when I was in my early 20s. And he said something in a meeting. He said, our perception becomes our reality. So we can't, like, we can't change that your dad died. And that sucks. Right? It sucks your dad died. And we wish, we, you know, we, we wish Pop Pop was still here. But... He left me a hundred and fifty five thousand dollar inheritance, and I paid off my debt and have a down payment for a house, and that has shifted my life. The last thing that my dad did was he gave me one last hand to get get on the straight and narrow and get set up. And we can go through and choose to say, well, this is how I will will remember my dad, even though he fucking died. And that's terrible. The last thing that he did was help me out. And we can choose to view it like that, or we can wallow in self-pity and say, oh, he's not here and all that. And it's like, and that doesn't change anything. Right. So we, we need to control how we view it. We need to control our perspective, right? If you can't go to work and you're in lockdown, 
man, I get it. That fucking sucks. Because especially as a man, a huge part of your value that you prescribed yourself comes from earning your keep. You got to earn your salt. You got to pull your weight. And if that's what you've done your entire life and that's how you derive a lot of satisfaction, there's nothing wrong with that. But we need to go through and not just have that turn into buying, you know, cheap shit off of Amazon and Chinese fentanyl. Yeah. Right? yeah. If you have an internet connection and your cell phone, which you probably do, what is it that you're learning? How is it you're going to make yourself better? Because here's the thing, everything changes. It's a cycle. In, uh, in, uh, in Jewish tradition, there's a word called Shemitah. And it talks about a cycle that happens roughly every, se every seven years. Mm -hmm. And you can watch financial markets. You can watch all these different things. And there's a cycle that happens every, about every seven years. Sometimes it cycles at six, sometimes at eight, but it's on average about seven. So as bad as it is today, it's going to be better. The economy's down right now, but here's the thing. When the dot-com crash happened, it was the end of the world. Just like it was in the 1930s. Just like right, all these crashes that have happened. So what is it we need to do to set ourselves up for when it gets better? And here's the thing. If it doesn't get better, what is it we need to do to set ourselves up for whatever normal is going to be? Ace, I, and, I like that you bring up the Shemitah thing, right? Because if I'm remembering my biblical history correct, it is about every seven years. Uh, but there is a cycle where it prescribes letting your orchard rest, right? Letting your crops rest, or at least a portion of them, uh, every so often of those seven-year cycles. And we can look right here and say, okay, what does that kind of mean in this context? And what comes to my mind is a reset, right? I'm not talking about the great reset, all that conspiracy crap. I'm talking about giving it a rest, giving it a reset, letting things kind of settle, letting the dust settle and picking back up and moving forward an even better version of yourself. And that's kind of what I take from what you just said about the Shemitah, which I think is brilliant, uh, is, hey, yeah, you need to keep working, you need to keep pushing, but every so often letting yourself kind of reset and come out a better version of yourself like the lockdowns. Well, and it's, it's just about taking control, right? Taking control of what you can control. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. if you're stuck in your house and your house is a, is dirty as fuck, right? Well, you're going to be miserable. If your house is in order and you're controlling the thing you can control, you know what? I'm stuck here, but I can make sure things are tidy. I can make sure that I'm working out every day. Mm -hmm. Right. I can go through and, you know, find language lessons for Spanish or something like that, or uh, functional Arabic or whichever I can go through and I can do that on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And so as an example, if I wind up doing a little bit of that and got some functional Arabic and I wind up going into a job interview and I see that the guy across the, across the way from me has a Muslim name and I greet him, assalamu alaikum, and he, right, and he responds, alaikum assalam, all of a sudden rapport's been built. The likelihood of me getting that job probably increased by 15%. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, there's nothing like studying a language just to, if for nothing else, just to kind of fire those neurons in your brain, get it thinking a different way. Ace, do you speak, do you speak any other languages? Do you study ling linguistics at all? Um, I speak English fluently. Um, I can get by in Spanish, probably about 70 or 80% fluent. Um, like I can go, I can go on dates and go to the boxing gym, CrossFit gym. I, like I can go out without requiring a chaperone or a translator. Uh, sometimes I sound like a bit of a caveman, <laughs> um, but I've, I lived in Mexico for a couple months and I lived in, uh, or in Tijuana for a couple months. And then, uh, the following year I lived in a place called, uh, Queretaro or Queretaro, which is like central Mer Mexico. If you're looking for it, the airport code is QRO hmm. and it's, there's, it's nowhere near a beach. It's, uh, 
it's a really uh, kind of famous historical uh, city, lots of colonial stuff. It's got a real neat aqueduct. Um, very, very, very neat. The church, like going, going there to just see the churches alone is wild. Cobblestone streets and it's gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. That sounds, that sounds really cool. Uh, yeah. yeah so. it, it's, it's such an important thing, especially Spanish these days, right? Especially if you're living in the American continent, like it really pays dividends to be able to communicate with other people in their native tongue. Well, uh, 20, they, they estimate 25% of the United States speaks Spanish as their first language. Yeah. Now we can go through and talk about the politics of that if you want, but 25% speak that as their first language. And depending on the region you're in, there's places I've been in your country in which uh, I'm glad I spoke Spanish because I wouldn't have been able to order what I wanted on my, like, like order my food properly. Yeah. I wouldn't have been able to get what I needed. And for me, I look at it as an opportunity to speak, uh, to, to speak Spanish, um, which I don't get a lot chance to, to talk to about here about that. And then I found out where the, uh, where the best taco spot was without having crossed the border. So yeah, no, it, you know what? I mean, we can definitely get into the politics of that. Uh, but I will just say you can look at things two different ways, right? Like you said, you can look at it as fucking a, like we're getting invaded by all of these, you know, different types of people. They may not, you know, speak enough English or whatever, whatever. Or you can look at it and say, Hey, you know, this is an opportunity for me to kind of learn more about that culture, um, infiltrate it, so to speak, and, you know, kind of get in there and use it to my advantage, right? Because so many Americans, at least, um, really do look at it as a very negative thing. And I'm not, I'm not giving away my personal opinion one way or the other at this point, but I'm saying that the majority of Americans are not happy about what's going on right now. Uh, the sentiment is that they're not sending their best and brightest over here, which very well may be true, but uh, you can... You can look at everything like you've been discussing about mindset. You can look at everything in, you know, in the most negative of light, or you can try to put a positive spin on it and say, I'm going to use this to my advantage. Yeah. So how, how do you, how do you want to look at it? Right. right. Um, if you go through and you look at what's right, like if, if you want to have the attitude, well, this is, this is America. We speak English. You got to speak English. Sure. That's true. English is the language of commerce. Now, let's say something happens and you need to drop below the radar for an extended period of time. You having a second language allows you to lay low in a immigrant community full of a bunch of people that are maybe they're legally, maybe they're illegally. But here's the thing. You being able to speak that language and navigate that, it winds up having a fair amount of utility. Yeah. So you going through and be able to be in there, and here's the thing, all of a sudden, all of a sudden you have access to cash jobs. You need to lay low, right? Like you're not, you're not able to go through and pull a social security number, but if you speak enough Spanish, you get in there good, you can go through and provide help to them in that you're a native English speaker and you can go places that they can't and kind of take care of things that they can't, but you can also go and work a cash job with them. Mm -hmm. And so how is it you want to view it? You can go through and focus on this kind of beating your chest, or you can just realize like, this is the world I live in and going through and building better relationships is useful. Right. Wealth is wealth is not material necessarily. I mean, there's a certain amount of how many bars of gold that you have, but your relationships, your relationships will matter. And people that feel as outsiders, right, whether they're new Canadians or new Americans, right? If if you walk into a room and nobody there is like you. Right. You walk right. Like, say, say you walk, uh, you walk into a bar in Minnesota. Right. And you wind up walking into uh, little, uh, little Addis Ababa. There's a there's a large Habesha community there. And you walk into it and you look around, and you're like, holy shit, am I in the wrong place? <laughs> right. 
right? You're going to have a certain reaction to that, a certain visceral feeling. If someone walks up to you with a smile and greets you, how much is that going to mean to you? Right. If somebody takes the time when you feel like an outsider to bridge that gap and say, hey, man, like, how, how can I help? The amount of difference that that makes for you, and obviously it will make for them, in how comfortable they are, the development of rapport, all of that, you won't forget that person. And you'll want to help them. And so when we go through and we make the effort um, on our uh, on the podcast that uh, you and I did um, when you were on ours, I mentioned that I applied my trade working as a doorman. At one time, I could extend pleasantries in more than 12 languages. And whether, right, whether, whether that's Tagalog, whether that's uh, Arabic, whether, you know, Amharic, Swahili, uh, your bit, right, German, Spanish, um, some of the Slavic tongues. Going through and taking the time to be able to identify somebody by their name and how they look and be able to greet them in their own language. Even if all you know is hello and thank you, you should, you should see how it changes. When I go through the Minneapolis airport in which there's a lot of Habesha people there for, uh, for those that don't know, um, the uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea are considered Habesha. So the majority of them will speak Amharic, which is a language from Ethiopia. When I thank them in Amharic and I say, I'm Seganalo, they just light up <laughs> because here's some white dude who looks like a hayseed that just thank them in a very specific language. And they can't stop smiling. It almost made their day because someone gave a shit enough. So my politics of it aside, functionality, do you want people to like you? And by go by taking the time to learn about other cultures, bits and pieces, how to say hello, how to say thank you, right? You don't really need more than that. Bits and pieces about their food, right? Right. Whether it's you know whether it's baba ganoush or kebab or right like the right different types of ceviche, all that, right? And here's the thing, be generally interested in knowing a little bit of all that. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot more utility and you'll be, able to, you'll be able to blend in. And if you ever need to drop below the radar, you already have a network. Brilliant, brilliant. Because those, like those, those illegal communities, those immigrant communities, right? Are very close knit. Yeah, they're very close knit and uh, <laughs> There's a lot of people within them also trying to live below the radar. So it's, I love that you brought that up, man. You know, this really brings out another question that I had for you was the difference between soft skills and hard skills. And I'm going to let you take it away here. Uh, I want you to kind of tell us the difference between soft skills, what that might be and hard skills, what those might be. And kind of just to tie it all together, how many, how much percentage of our time should we be studying soft skills and what should we be studying hard skills? Uh, whether that's 50, 50, whether that's 30, 40, uh, I'm going to kind of leave it up to you to, uh, to educate us and, you know, give us your spin on what you think about that. So it depends on what the goal is, right? It's if you're looking to make posts on Instagram, um, going through and, you know, being out on the range, turn, turn it a bunch of, uh, a bunch of cartridges into brass. Um, that's fun, right? Like it's a lot of fun to do. It's right. Gets you a lot of, a lot of kind of likes on the gram, mm -hmm. uh, going through and knife fighting and doing all that shit. It, if you're doing it for social media, yeah, for sure. Soft, uh, where if you have a very active life 
in the way in which you handle violence, right? Like, so say you look at a police officer and police officers will, will be in more physical altercations than any soldier or tier one operator ever will be, right? Like they're, they're probably going hands-on with somebody that wants to hurt them at least once a week, mm -hmm. right? So even with that, we go through and we look at that altercation, maybe last 30 minutes, right? And that'd be a long fight, right? What percentage of your time is that? So violent altercations are a black swan event mm -hmm. in which we are insuring against them. We're insuring against black swan events with a lot of time training. Now, that time training improving our physicality and our health and all that stuff. Great. And we want to ensure against that. So the amount of time that we spend on that is going to be disproportionate, but soft skills. I use my soft skills every day, several times a day. Mm -hmm. I use it when I walk into the gas station, I use it all the time. Um, so if we're talking about soft skills purely in a social engineering kind of thing, um, you talk to people every day. You literally will interact with strangers all of the time. And so an example of soft skills is, right, can you, can you have a conversation with anyone? Right? Can you have a conversation with anyone about anything? So soft skills doesn't necessarily need to be social engineering as much as it's just being generally aware of a bunch of different stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's not like I need to go, I don't need to know a whole bunch about firefighting to have a conversation with somebody about firefighting. Right. I need to know a little bit, and then I need to take them through a framework, I, or a framework that is commonly called the W5. Who, what, where, why, when, how. Mm. Based on the answers that you give to my questions, I ask better questions. And the thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the thing that you know a lot about, mm. right? And so whatever you're nerdy about, I just need to find that out. Rod Stewart, as an example, is really nerdy about model trains, <laughs> right? So if I want old Roddy to like me and get invited over for a barbecue to his house, I just got to get him going on model trains. And the guy won't shut up. <laughs> and so whatever that thing is, and when you go through and create a situation, right, through soft skills, in which somebody feels like an expert, right? If you're into Magic the Gathering or Dungeons and Dragons or whatever it is, if I can go through and find out what it is that you're into, you'll have a large area of expertise on that. And if I go through and create a situation where you can talk about this thing that you know a lot about and are very passionate about. And all I need to do is just ask questions. And I, and I'm not saying like, like be present for the con, uh, be present for the conversation, be involved, be interested to hear what that person has to say. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's important that the distinction that you draw there is to be present for the conversation, be involved. Um, you know, I, I think it, it takes a little bit more than just asking the questions. It also takes that genuine kind of interest in wanting to know what the other, other person is telling you, is saying to you, uh, to really kind of build that rapport, if I'm not mistaken. 100%. And, and I mean, things like, are you asking questions to be polite or do you want to know? Right. Because people figure that out real quick. Um, and, and then, I mean, when we go through and we look at like hard skills, what types of hard skills are we talking about? Like fighting and kicking ass because the most useful physical skill that I have learned is cooking. Hmm. Cooking has got me places to stay, right. For, for like several days in a stranger's house because I could cook, Right going through and having, right? Like if, 
if we're looking at skills, understanding how things work and how to generally fix stuff, we should know how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, when we go through and we look at when the only thing that you know how to do is, is pull a trigger. That's really specialized, but there's, that's such a rare, such a rare incident. Yeah. Right. Compared to helping someone fix a fence, compared to cooking someone dinner. And if you can do things right, like cooking dinner, right. Helping fix a fence. You can, you know, you're useful. I don't know where we would, where we would class it as far as hard skills or soft skills, but if you're looking at a survival situation in another country and you carry with you a certain expertise, you are more useful alive than you are dead. Yes. Um, a guy who, uh, a guy who's, I consider one of my mentors, uh, uh, tell, uh, talked about the reason he learned to cook was because he found himself around a bunch of ragtag psychopaths and the food was shit <laughs> and he could already kind of cook. And so he's like, you know what, the way that I'm not going to get killed by my own, because these guys will kill me to, to just take my macro off, off me because they don't have one, like a bunch of like fucking psychopaths. He said, you know what, I'm going to go through and make sure the food's better. <laughs> Because the locals can't cook worth a shit. Smart. Yeah. And I mean, if you go through and you look at all the jobs that are out there, cooking isn't that hard a one. So if you're a good cook, you can get yourself out of doing a lot of shitty work and like backbreaking work and get to be in the kitchen cooking. And if you're good at it, no one's going to bitch at all. Yeah. So Point. I guess my question to you is what do we consider a hard skill versus a soft skill? Like, are we talking hard skills are like breaking things and people? No, I mean, that's, that's a great, that's a great rhetorical question that you asked there. And I'm glad that you brought it up the way that you did as far as look, technically anything kind of physically that you're doing could be a hard skill. Uh, soft skills are soft skills, right? But then we go into the arena, like, what do we classify as hard skills, soft skills? Could we classify medical stuff as soft skills? But we could also classify as hard skills. But I guess what I'm saying here is, to echo what you were saying, Ace, you really need to be developing yourself as a warrior, as an individual, not only just a warrior, but as an individual, in such a way where you are all around useful. So I, I think that what you're saying there is absolutely brilliant. And whether you, whether you want to put this into kind of a mil military or paramilitary context, right? Like if you're living with a group of guys, right? You're living with a team of guys, whether you're overseas working in EP, you know, uh, paramilitary gig, right? Or whether you're with a special forces team or even just, you know, domestically here doing something, living out of state with, with a group of guys, right? learning how to cook would be an amazing asset to them, right? And like you said, maybe you don't have to clean the freaking rest of the place if you're busy cooking. Maybe you don't have to, you know, <laughs> clean all the weapons if you're busy cooking, right? It gets you out of some good stuff. Uh, another thing, like you were saying, um, is the linguistics. Knowing how to communicate with that other guy on your team from, you know, Ethiopia or Somalia or freaking, you know, Iraq, uh, we'll, we'll gain nothing but rapport with him. And then also to boot, you can fucking talk about shit behind the other guy's backs. Cause they don't know what the hell you're saying. So there's just a multitude of uses. I mean, I know even in certain seer curriculums, from what I understand, fixing an engine basically, or changing a tire is part of the curriculum, uh, because it's, it's skills like that, that a lot of guys don't honestly have these days. A lot of kids growing up right now, they are so busy in their smartphones and computers they don't know how to freaking change a tire without calling AAA, right? So learning these things not only develops you as a warrior, but, but just as a basic member of society. I like to uh, tell the story of my granddad. So my granddad was, he was an old fucking cowboy <laughs> called a Mac. And 
he was kind of, he he had this this kind of grumble when he spoke, um, kind of like Rooster Cogburn from True Grit, the the one with Jeff Bridges. Yeah, he chewed snooze. He wore a handkerchief. He could shoot a rifle. He could break a horse. Drank his whiskey straight. He could two step, right, which is a form of dance for those of you that don't know. And he cook and he cook fine Yorkshire pudding. <laughs> And he didn't shoot because he was a shooter. A rifle was a tool because mm-hmm. everyone could shoot. Well, what do you mean you can ride a horse? Everyone can ride a horse. My granny used to go to, used to like when she was like 11, would go to town to pick up her drunk dad from the bar with a horse and buggy. <laughs> right? So... It's just because that's what you did. And so it seems that we are looking for tribes. We're looking for these, this feeling of belonging more than we ever have. Yeah. So my granddad didn't spend all this time trying to learn how to fight. But if someone crossed him, he just spit his whiskey in their face and break a chair on him. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, like going, he, he didn't go and cut his own lumber down because he thought he was a lumberjack. He did it because he needed firewood, right? And so there's this, when you go through and you look at these different archetypes, right? Like to talk about different archetypes. You look at that of kind of a, a frontiersman. They were, they were a gunfighter. They were a cook. They were a mechanic. They had, they just, they just were. And they didn't think that, you know, well, I'm a shooter or I'm a hunter. Or I'm a this, some of that. And if you, the next time you're walking around, look for the guy who's wearing the real tree camo and just pay attention to the guy that wears the real tree camo. Cause he'll have all this stuff that is, I am tribe that is hunting. Mm-hmm. I hunt. That is what I do. I, I have wild meat. Right. Or you go through and you look at the guy who's wearing the Gucci tactical who's wearing 511. Right. Not that I have anything against 511. I mean, they're one of my competitors, but just using them because it's a familiar, familiar brand. Right. You know, you'll, you'll see the guy, he's got the 511 and he's got the black rifle coffee mug. And <laughs> right. He's, he's got the, you know, the operator, operator hats and the, like he's got the Oakley flat classes. And it's, it's this I am sheepdog. And this is this guy's tribe. And so, I think more than ever, we gravitate towards, for lack of a better word, these cliques, right? Yeah, Which is yeah. no different than, you know, the jocks and the preps and the goths and the skids and the skaters and the, the drama nerds and stuff like that in high school. It's no different. It's just now we've extended it out into cliques in the adult world. Mm. Um, and for me, I, I personally believe that it leaves a lot of people developmentally stunted. Yeah, yeah. No joke. Because we create this, we create this cool dumb club in which I know about this thing, right? Like, so uh, when the zombie apocalypse happens, what are you going to do? Um, what do you mean? Well, you know, like I have all this gold and like guns. Cool. Um, I'm actually just going to like light your house on fire. <laughs> what? Yeah. Right. And so we wind up having these things where people prepare for this fantasy, right? Prepping and the whole like tactical training thing. It's, yeah. it's, we're, we're preparing for a fantasy. It's not different than airsoft. Um, airsoft is just actually getting in simulations of gunfights all the time. Right. So people will look down on airsofters, but airsofters are, are actually going through and training tax- tactics in a more realistic way, more regularly. Yeah. And here's the thing. If you enjoy going and shooting full auto stuff or playing airsoft, that's awesome, man. Enjoy driving sports cars or motorbikes. That's awesome. But we need to be realistic about what it is we're doing. Are we just LARPing? (laughs) Right. If you went and took that close protection course, did you do that? So you can say that you did it on the ground. Are you doing that because you want to go and do that work, right? What's the motivation? Maybe you just want to do it because it's fun, right? Like I'm learning how to throw knives, 
right? I've thrown knives before. I'm learning a very specific way of throwing knives because I think it's interesting, right? I've, and it's necessary that I'm realistic about why I'm doing it because I think it's interesting. I don't, you know, I don't think that I'm carrying around a throwing knife and I'm going to bury it in someone and there's this big standoff at high noon. When we talk about violence and preparing for violence and, and all that, what we need to understand is the bigger footprint we have on social media beating our chest, the greater disservice you're doing to yourself. Yeah, I agree with that. I'm fond of telling people there will be no standoff at high noon. If they want you, they'll shoot you in the back and they'll shoot you in the dark. Yeah. So what makes sense? Well, just to interject there, and I like what you said because 100% of it is true. But uh, the shootout at high noon is going on right now. And it's going on in the form of an information war, right? Uh, and I'm not trying to be cliche about it because I know, you know, info wars or whatever. But it's, it's very true. It's going on in the form of memes. It's going on in the form of sharing articles. It's going on in the form of, you know, honestly, social media right now. Um, so while I do agree with, you know, the fact that, you know, if it comes down to... <laughs> whatever in the end, yes, they have your number, they've got your name, they've got your ASS, right? Just like Sergeant Hartman said. But in the meantime, uh, we are fighting kind of a, a war of information here. And um, you need to be able to keep your enemy in the dark if you're going to win a fight ultimately, right? Like, isn't that one thing that, that governments are, are fond of doing when things kind of start hitting a civil unrest is uh, media blackouts or physical blackouts uh, so that su the supply chain can't organize, the people can't organize, but it just shows the, inf the importance of information and social media in this new modern era that we do live in. Well, and there's, and there's certain things that we, that you can know are going to happen. I don't know how far into that you want to go, right? Like um, comms will be blinked, power will be blinked. Um, and, that's kind of the first, those are the first things to go, right? Yeah. Okay, so running water, right? Running water is going to stop because the pumps are going to stop, right? Uh, Bor uh, Boris and True North Tradecraft has a, uh, has a couple books on disaster preparedness that are, are really, really well thought out. You I go read, through. I read his latest book, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, quick shout out to Boris and True North, True North Tradecraft. One of the better disaster preparedness books i've ever written read 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 and a uh, quick, quick retard moment for the for me right there um he really does uh, organize it in such a way where it's just it's very efficient so uh quick shout out to boris instagram true north tradecraft well and and little tips like okay power goes down what's the first thing that i do i need to go fill up my bathtub because there's going to be enough line pressure that I can pull a fair amount of water from the time those pumps go down. Yeah. So I need to go through and do that. Uh, if you live in a high rise apartment on the top floor, it takes a little bit to get water up there. Right. Mm -hmm. So going through and I mean, knowing that what's going to happen, right. Power is going to go down. Comms are going to go down. So, if your cell phone's not working, your internet's not working, that's kind of a, a good indication of stuff starting to pop. If that happens at the same time that the power goes out, that's a good indication. So, right? Ace, what do we do in that situation? I mean, should we already have had kind of a network of people that we can talk to face to face, hand to hand, or uh, or, or what? Um. Guys, guys that are, are kind of better resources on the comm side, I'd be a fella SoCal off grid um, on Instagram, um, going through and looking at uh, different radio communications. Um, there's, there's a few guys in that sphere in the, in the SPC group that, that they're posting about pirate boxes and things like that. And that's, that's really their expertise in their wheelhouse, but going through and having some type of comms, right? Um, and being able to go through and communicate. So you can go through and set up pirate boxes and repeater stations and things like that. And that's a little bit of what was happening in the Arab Spring uh, in Egypt. Um, and you can kind of create a, uh, 
an intra uh, an intraweb or an intranet, so to speak. But the real the real kind of important thing to remember is when is the ark built? Yeah. yeah. Before the rain. Yeah. Right. It's built before the rain. So going through and learning about communications, uh, going through and trying to worry about, well, how do I get a firearm? I mean, if you're, if you wait till you need it, it's kind of too late. Yeah. It ain't going to be I, there. That's for sure. Well, it, I mean, that's, that's it. And to go through and live your life in fear doesn't make a lot of sense, but to go through and have some extra food, some non-perishables around, that's not being a prepper. You go through to give the example of my grandma, my grandma and my granddad to go through and have, you know, six months of food in the cellar, a year's worth of food in the cellar, but like with canned, canned goods and stuff like that. That was just what you did because you might get snowed in and you might not be able to leave the farm for the entire winter. So you needed to make sure that you had water. You need to make sure that you had food and all of that. And there's the technology for things like solar panels and uh, those solar heat tubes. There's a lot of really cool stuff you can do with those. You can go through and you can go through and, and using those solar heat tubes, a heat well and a Stirling engine, go through and get a solar power generator that will last considerably longer than solar panels in which you can go through and convert convert the sunlight directly into mechanical energy. And if you want to, you can use it to drive a gang shaft uh, for mechanical work. Um, especially if you're going through and setting it up on a flywheel, you can go through and use it for a generator. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you can do. And that here's the thing that tech's never been more available. Yeah. Going through and, and understanding how things were done the old way is never a bad thing. Um, and with, right, whether it's preserving food, like all of it, mm -hmm. but you having extra food, right? Whether it's three months, six months, a year, um, it makes sense. Knowing things like uh, a two kilogram jar of peanut butter in which you can get the no name stuff you can get for probably $5 or less. That'll sustain you will for two days in calories. Are you going to be happy eating peanut butter? For two well, days, I love, I love peanut butter, so yeah, I'll be happy as a clam. But well, after a few months, or maybe not. But right. here's the thing: you have the calories that you need, and going through and knowing basics like that, um, right? Understanding, right? Like, okay, this is this is how much food I need to hit three thousand calories a day, mm -hmm. right? Easy way to do it: is jar of peanut butter. Right. Um, and going through and looking at, well, how do I get my protein? Well, there's some in there, but if I'm going through and I'm making, you know, hood wrap rations, it's I'll take Ziploc bags. I'll toss a scoop of protein powder in a Ziploc bag, roll it up. And I will typically bank to have uh, a scoop of protein powder four to five times uh, per day. And I will typically have uh, 10 eat more bars, hmm. right? Yeah, both that. And the reason are, the reason is because it's got the calories I need. And all I need to do is add water to it. So going through and doing that, like what is it that I need to kind of stay on track? And if you know that, okay, an average male needs about 3000 calories. It's actually a slight caloric surplus. You need average guy, probably about 2,800. Yeah. So if we can go through and figure out that this is what I need for food, right? A woman, an average woman could sustain herself on a jar of peanut butter for three and a half to four days. Yeah. Right. The biggest advantage what women have over men is they use less calories. Their metabolism is slower. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, they, they're typically smaller. Right. Well, so call that an advantage or a disadvantage, depending on <laughs> how you look at it. <laughs> Well, like, like go, go through and, and kind of knowing those things. So what is it that we need to do? Um, okay. If I don't have access to a huge calorie bank and I need to stay strong, 
how, how do I train so that I don't need huge, a huge amount of calories to recover mm. going through and looking at stuff like, um, sets of, uh, sex, uh, sets of six for kettlebell swings mm. every, right. Uh, every, every two minutes, every three minutes, right. Okay. I'm going to go through and hit that. I'm going to do that five times and focus on that explosive contraction, right. Going through and focusing on things like isometrics, right. In which you're just staying purely in your phosphate system so that we can maintain the strength and the explosiveness that we need to, if we need it without going through and like just nuking the number of calories we need. Yeah. Right. So the more that we can learn about anything, uh, the better off we'll be. And you'll never really know. There's plenty of things that I've learned in other places completely unrelated to what I do now that I've been able to apply. The mark is an example. The mark is based off of a third grade science experiment because it pulls the weight straight down. You hook set it on the end of the table. You put your bag on it and the weight is pulled straight down and it balances on its, uh, on, on the end. That's something I picked up from a third grade science fair. Hmm. Hmm. Right. You know, there's a lot of really cool stuff on your YouTube channel that is just down and dirty practical stuff. Um, two things that come to mind right now, the Ranger Band Trigger Press, which was pretty cool. It's just kind of giving you that extra dexterity, that extra sensitivity in your trigger finger. I mean, like you said, it's not all about the shooting, but there is a large portion of our audience who feels that life is nothing but shooting. So it's, it's also a lot of fun. Like, let's be real. It's fun to go and put some rounds down range. And it's, it's, it's another hobby. It's another thing that guys get really into. And it's like anything else, whether it's golf or whether it's shooting or whether it's, you know, like you and I, the jujitsu, uh, once you get into it, you have a hard time thinking about anything, but so oh, man. Little tips yeah. like that are, are key, man. And another thing that I want to bring up is for you guys and girls out there, I know shamogs are a really popular thing, or if you're, you're being authentic, a kofia, they're really, um, they're cool guy gear, right? <laughs> and actually they're more practical these days than ever before here in, uh, in the West, because, you know, you need to cover your face, right? So whether you're in the sun or not, you still need to cover your face. So shamogs are cool. And you have a really cool video about the SAS method of tying a shamog which I thought was cool. So you've got just such a plethora of like different things. Uh, and you're really a man after my own heart. Cause I never like to focus on just martial arts on the uh, IG page. I never lo- like to focus on just survival. Like it's all about an all encompassing kind of thing that we're doing here. And you really provide such, you know, such a, a wide variety of tips, tactics and trade craft that uh, I, I just, I have to really harp on the fact that your YouTube channel is such an excellent resource for guys and girls out there. How did you kind of put together the brand of Alpha 2 Delta? What inspired you to start this brand up? Uh, so Delta 2 Alpha launched, um, uh, Delta 2 Alpha launched uh, as a result of the mark. So the mark was originally designed for another, uh, for a guy who was one of my teachers. Um, I was a instructor in his system. Um, and I, right. He want, uh, it said that he wanted something, um, along those lines. So I went through and put it together. He decided that he didn't think it was viable, which was cool. And me being young and naive, I was like, I was just passionate. I was like, well, you know, like if, if you're not interested, like I'd, like, like, I just want to see it out there. Mm-hmm. And so I, uh, I said, well, like, if you're, if you're not, uh, if you're not interested, like I'll, like, I, I get it. Um, but I'm, I'm going to pursue it anyway. I'll, I'll go through and get some made. And I mean, I had even offered to go through and, Hey, I'll, I'll go through and get the first batch made. And like, we can put them, uh, you can put them out there and, and see how they do. And, and all I, I just want to recover my cost. And, and just, you know, if, if you don't mind, if you could have my name after yours and we say we, we developed it together. Um, and so I very quickly 
uh, being unaware of the way the world worked, found, uh, found myself to be an instructor. I was kicked out of that system. And I was like, okay. And as, uh, as Tupac said, you should have never got me started. <laughs> and so it kind of started from there. Um, uh, Delta 2 Alpha originally started, it was myself and another guy. Uh, the other guy is never seen publicly. Um, and, uh, and since his, uh, uh, since his let, uh, has left the company to pursue kind of family life and things like that, just kind of priorities. Uh, and his, uh, his first initial was D and, uh, mine was, uh, mine was a, so uh, Delta two alpha is literally that, but it also means a whole bunch of other things. And when you look at the logo, when you read the name, it winds up being, it winds up conjuring up a lot of things to a lot of people. Yeah. And so, yes, it means that, but it also means a bunch of other things. Um, and then so we, uh, after we got the mark out there, did an instructional video on it. Him and I had both carried knives our entire life. And grew up in a rural area. Uh, you know, you, you get a knife when you're six years old. You're a young man now, right? <laughs> and, and people are like, well, like for what? For whatever came up. And they're like, oh, like, it must have been violent. No, it's for doing chores. It's because you need to open a package. You need to cut a piece of, piece of twine. You need to actually do work. And knives are good tools. Yeah. So we built a, a knife called the H2 Sierra. We built it from the ground up. Um, and... It was made by uh, Fox Knives out of Maniago, Italy. Uh, it was a very, very big and expensive project for, uh, for us to undertake at the time. And for, uh, for those that have uh, been fortunate enough to get one, uh, they, uh, they repeatedly tell us it is one of the most robust pocket knives they've ever, they've ever used. I've spoken to guys who own your knives, and they honestly, they say that they don't want to ever carry anything else. They are that good. It's we we built it to lock up like a fixed blade, and there's a whole bunch of little details like the liner, the like where the liner interfaces with the blade to lock it up is radius. So as it so as it wears, the liner is not going to fail. Um, going through and looking at the contact point where that happens is carbided, right? So it has carbide dust impregnated into it to make sure it doesn't wear prematurely. Uh, the handle is not flat. Uh, the scales are, uh, are three-dimensional, they're rounded. And the reason is so that it fills your hand the same way that a K-bar does. Like the, the, the traditional uh, Marine Corps K-bar yeah. is round and it fills your hand because those flat scales create a hollow in your grip mm -hmm. and it feels weak. So there's kind of all those things that we did. We used an oversized handle um, so that it can be used to kind of hammer things like windows and stuff like that open. Um, the, uh, the way the handle is shaped, it's, it's actually a Coca-Cola bottle. It's the bottom half of Coca-Cola bottle that's been mirrored. Huh. And so the way that it happens, being fat in the center, next down, it gets fat. It'll fit your hand like it fits my hand, like it fits your day's hand. Hmm. Hmm. Be, right? So going through and putting finger, finger grooves and stuff like that on knives, that'll only ever fit one person. Hmm. Well, where the, of all the things that we do, I would say handle design is probably the best thing that we, the, or the thing we're best at. You guys also have a trainer available for the H2 Sierra as, as well. Yeah. And if uh, they're made from the exact same steel and we intentionally didn't put holes in the blade. So somebody could actually take one and grind it sharp if they wanted to. Mm. Um, and yeah. And so going through and, going through and, and putting that stuff out is right. We, we, we kind of did that and then we just sat there on it and kind of looked and we started getting into, uh, we started getting into what, uh, what the partner that left referred to as mission creep, which is one of the reasons that, uh, that he kind of left was because it was starting to expand past what he'd signed up for. Mm. Um, and with family commitments, he just wasn't able to keep up. So we went through and rolled out things like the Jackal, um, 
going through and rolling out some escape tools, uh, just a bunch of stuff, the domino and, um, and just designing things to fill what I needed um, for, for when I was traveling. Cause I traveled one bag. So the domino has it, the domino is a small utility knife. It takes Stanley blades and there is no tool required. You can quickly change the Stanley blade. So I'm going into an airport. I open up the domino. I pull the blade out. I stick it. I stick into uh, uh, through the lid of a coffee cup that's in the garbage can, so the blade's safe, doesn't cut anyone. I put it back together. I go through uh, airport security. When I land, I go to the local, you know, dollar store, or whichever, and I pick up a Stanley blade, right? And I'm using Stanley just to describe the style, but you can get ones from Home Depot or wherever. And everywhere I've been in, everywhere I've been, they always have that blade design. And he just uses uh, rare earth magnets. You just slide it in, it locks in place. Wow. And now you have a, uh, I would call it a, a, a light duty box cutter. Um, and it locks up and it, it looks slick. It's, it's decent if you're in an office or something like that. And people get a little sensitive about uh, carrying knives and weapons and things like that. But it just looks cool. It's just neat. Um, so we started looking at that. Uh, we This year, we put out uh, something called a UPAC uh, TTP or a tactical travel panel. And that allows you to take a skivvy roll and pack it flat. And it takes about the same room as a laptop. So you can have a change of shorts, change of socks, and a T-shirt. And it all kind of folds up on this board flat. We send it out with a six mil poly bag. So it stays, stays dry, stays neat and folded. So if you're traveling, your stuff's all together. Um, now, if you're out in the bush, your stuff's going to stay dry, uh, but it stays together. If you have to go through and try to find something in the bottom of your pack, because your pack doesn't open all the way, you can take that stuff out and don't have to worry about getting it wet or where you set it or getting bugs in it and things like that. That's really great. I so remember. we, uh, we did that. Um, for me, traveling, uh, socks and underwear were, were kind of one of the big, uh, big questions. Yeah. And to the point that, like, so when I'm traveling, I travel with one bag, carry on only. I, I typically travel with about a change of I, the, the clothes that I'm wearing plus uh, two to three changes of clothes, mm -hmm. right? Of like, uh, of, uh, of socks and underwear. Um, and, uh, and a t-shirt. And then I procure everything else that I need. Now, depending on whether I'm mobile or not, uh, if I'm going to be in a place for a while, I can, I'll go through and I'll go to a local store and buy a, you know, 12 pack of black socks or whatever. But for, uh, the, the problem definitely became, I needed stuff that I could hand wash, hang it to dry and have it dry, like hang dry within 24 hours without necessarily having to put it out in the sun. Mm -hmm. so the uh so we had uh underwear made our our sweet ace trunks and we focused on uh, anti-chafe and quick dry quick dry because you don't want to be funky um and it's nice to uh, keep the boys cool as well as anti-chafe because if you're sitting on a plane you're sitting in a car you're driving for a living you're uh, you're wearing a wearing a bat belt or whatever. If you got if you got some chafe going on, you'll know it for a while. You're carrying a pack, right? Hiking, and so we focused on those those two things. And our underwear compares to sacks and package and all kind of the high end ones because that's who we the same factory that makes a lot of them. We had ours designed, right? We right to our spec. We sent a design we had it made in the same factories. So we've gone through and had it uh, given it to uh, sent it out for testing to guys that are like, I mean, they wear nice underwear and like these easily, easily are on par, if not better. Um, and the, and the price is about half, right? Because we want to produce things that everyone can afford. Now, what I'll tell you is anyone that gets ours, Loves him. I, uh, I just had a guy, uh, uh, I just had a guy go through and order another 10 pairs. 
Uh, there's another guy that took a few pairs on a hunting trip, came back, uh, swore at me, told me he had to throw all his under other underwear out, and then I, <laughs> that that he was replacing them with with ours. Now, here's the thing: from a marketing standpoint, it's really tough to market underwear to macho guys because nine out of ten men don't want to look at pictures of men in their underwear. So, you, like, how do you display the product, right? And of the one in ten that might. They don't necessarily want to be seen looking at pictures of men in their own. <laughs> right. So you kind of have this thing is like, like those, those that get it rave about it to us, but like everyone's kind of too cool for school and doesn't want to go through and like leave a review. Cause they don't want to like, cause we're men, we don't talk about nice underwear. You know, I, I want to have, you know, the cotton ones from when I was a kid that welds to my ass after, you know, sitting in a car for eight hours. <laughs> right. So that was probably one of the one of the more interesting things that we uh, we rolled out, and uh, currently uh, currently working through the two thousand pairs that we ordered. You know, so if, no, stuff, if nothing yeah. else, I got underwear for the rest of my life, bro. <laughs> this stuff is really ideal for um, you know guys out there in the EP profession, in the PI profession, and not just for tactical guys. But you know, it sounds to me like I mean the life I used to live on the road in the car a lot, right? In a hotel room for a couple of nights. This is really, really ideal stuff for that type of work. Um, I want to just ask you real quick about the Tengu chassis. This is a knife that really reminds me of like an old Tonto samurai knife. And I thought it was fascinating. Where did you get the inspiration for this? Uh, so it's a, it's a chassis, um, just like a, a hot rod, like a car chassis. Chassis, okay. So the Tengu is just our interpretation of a, bl a Japanese blade design called Naikuchi. So Naikuchi were typically carried by uh, kind of the upper class uh, nobility, kind of political types, as well as uh, prostitutes. Um, <laughs> it served a similar purpose to what the Derringer did in the Old West. Um, if you put the, if you take two and you set them side by side, it is. Uh, it's a dagger. It's just half of a dagger. Mm. Um, they are incredibly good at penetrating the way that the uh, blade swoops. It doesn't get hung up on uh, hung up or caught in clothing. But it was uh, they were designed for piercing through uh, textiles and stuff like that. Mm. We added a finger choil on there, which was much about like just kind of uh, tying it together with a with a dagger, like a Gerber Mark One. For anyone that doesn't know, the Gerber Mark I is kind of the quintessential dagger. It's probably one of the best ones that's ever been produced. Um, if you can find one, go get it. If you can find a copy, go get it. Uh, so we added that finger choil on there um, just for a little bit of comfort, as well as it gives you something to uh, attach a sheet to. Or, or, or sorry, yeah, for your sheet to bite on with this Kydex, you want to make a, make a thumb break. Ah, very cool, man. I, I really like the products you're putting out there. And I know that you've got a set of focus mitts coming out very soon, uh, which I actually probably will end up picking up a pair of those uh, because obviously what I do, focus mitts are an essential part of the job, but they're also just very cool. What, what branded you, what made you decide to go into the focus mitt um, arena of things? Cause I know that's a very specialized thing. Yeah, so I I had them made to my spec um, when I uh, ran a school uh, where we taught uh, we taught combatives um, and we we still teach it just typically privately or in a seminar format mm -hmm. called Modus CQC. Modus was just the name of the gym and close quarter combatives because I didn't feel like naming it after myself. <laughs> um, one of the big things that we focused on was striking mechanics. Um, when I had, uh, had some exposure to Krav and had some exposure to, uh, some other arts, um, one of my big beefs with them was there was this kind of idea that, well, you just hit them, especially with stuff like Krav and combatives and things like that. Um, from my exposure, it was, well, you hit them. Okay. Well, how, well, like with your hand, <laughs> duh. All right. And so like, Okay, 
And so I realized that I was being asked to teach techniques that would set up a strike and the exclamation, like the exclamation point being the strike, but no one knew how to draw the exclamation point. Right? So going through and looking at it, it's like, okay, what does it take for me to survive a violent encounter, have someone survive a violent encounter? Well, you need to be able to generate sufficient force to cause an injury. You have to apply that force in a way that will cause an injury, and you need to be able to minimize the, uh, minimize the chances of you receiving an injury. Okay, so I'm trying to minimize the chances of me receiving an injury. That's the last part. If I can't generate sufficient force to cause an injury, I won't be able to apply it in a way that will cause an injury. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if I can go through and block something because I'm going to keep blocking it until I, until I can't. <laughs> so to me, it seemed like this, this big kind of gap. So um, I went through and took applied mechanics and biomechanics and I applied it to striking. And I didn't care what it looked like. I didn't care where it came from. I just wanted to know what worked. And so when you go through and remove human body from it and you just say a body, it becomes an equation. So we start going through and looking at um, in order for, so in order for, in order for us to go through and impart sufficient force to cause an injury, I need to have two things. I need to have, ma I need to worry about the mass in motion, usually my own, and the speed of the contact surface. So if I am shifting my body weight, it doesn't matter if I'm rotating, it doesn't matter whether I'm stepping, if my body weight is in motion, And it is moving in a direction. So if I'm moving towards you, right, a small step towards you, and my arm is locked out straight, I'm hitting you with everything that I weigh. Let's say that's 150 pounds. If I walked, if I take that step towards you, right, and I have my elbow down, my fist is vertical, a la Wing Chun, and I, sh as I'm moving towards you, I shoot my hand out like a piston. I have gone through and accelerated the speed of the contact surface and I have my entire mass behind it. And so that will do work. Mm -hmm. And then when we go, right? So there's different ways that we can do that. There's like a, uh, uh, a Russian hook or a gancho de Russo um, in which it works more like a whip and you wind up looking at ball and chain types of energy and all of that. And I haven't seen anyone teach strike mechanics the way that we do. So one of the things that we have in the works is, um, is a program on how we actually go through and train striking so we can hit hard um, and have it actually count. Uh, and that will, uh, that will work from both a, a self-defense as well as a, a competitive standpoint. And one of the big differences is the hand position. Um, I don't, I don't need to have my hands up when I'm fighting somebody in the street. And in some cases I don't want to have my hands up because I want it to be hidden and just to move and throw it. So we'll be going through and putting that out, but it's also an excuse that we're going to be releasing a bunch of a uh, bunch of just IG lives. And here's some basic pad drills. You and your right. You and your son are stuck at home during a pandemic or you and your buddy. And you want to kind of go through and work on something. You got a set of focus mitts. Let's go through and look at some basic tra uh, basic bad drills, right? Whether it's a you know a jab cross slip, a jab cross drift, jab cross dip, right? Going through and looking at how we can go through and make these things happen. Um, and to me, focus mitts are one of the most effective ways for training striking proficiency. I agree with that 100. percent Focus mitts are the shit. Um, you know, bag work is one thing, and it, you know you can practice your power, your strength, but uh, if you get a partner in focus mitts. You're golden. Um, and I wanted to touch on this real quick with you is your Bujinkan, your ninjutsu background. It's fascinating to me. You know, I took a couple of lessons back in the day before I moved on to like Krav and some other stuff, but I've always had a deep, deep fascination with the art of ninjutsu. And I'm saying that as an all encompassing thing, you know, the, uh, the secret squirrel type stuff. 
but uh, especially as it relates to the ancient Japanese, you know, culture and heritage tradition, what can you kind of tell us um, in a nutshell about ninjutsu? What did you think of it as someone who I really know is very well versed in combatives? Um, you know, what's your thoughts and opinion on ninjutsu? Um, I think that you learn a lot about fighting without learning how to fight. <laughs> well put. Um, very much like some of the some of the other arts. If you are, if you already know how to fight, there are concepts of ninjutsu that will greatly benefit you. Um, you're definitely looking at the traditional like senpai type of control drama bullshit, uh, and and it all it all depends on depends on the school, right? Like I've I've had the opportunity to teach uh, teach my combatives blend. Um, I got a chance to. Uh, to teach it at a uh, at a dojo in Australia when I was down there a few years ago, I went to visit a buddy of mine who I had actually taught, and his shihan, uh, a guy named Scott Scott Schulz, who was in Adelaide. Um, so he's a 15th degree black belt. Now Scott is a good size fella, like 280 probably, wow. like he's tall and he's thick. And he grew up bouncing the family bar. So Scott already knew how to fight. And so when Scott does ninjutsu, Scott could already fight and knows how to make it work because Scott could fight. When I went through and taught my combative stuff there, the way that I teach combatives is not the standard, I'm just going to steamroll you, right? Lots of successive rights right up the pipe. Um, I teach a lot of footwork, uh, and a lot of the combative stuff that I do is application work of, um, one of the specific schools in, uh, the Bujinkan, um, called Kobajitsu, uh, uh, specifically Kotoru Kobajitsu, which is a in fighting close art. And so when I went through and showed those concepts, what I told them was, what I'm showing you is not at odds. It's not contra to ninjutsu. It is ninjutsu. It's just when I had, when I was forced into situations where I needed to make this work, I didn't know how. Mm -hmm. So this is what I came to and this is how I adapted it. And what was, uh, what was really interesting and very kind of complimentary was the guy who was a Shihan and the majority of Shihans will not be like this. He was in there training, sweating like a pig in the Australian heat, in a like in a fucking coverall, <laughs> all right along with his guys. And he trained the whole day and didn't bitch or anything like that. And I would periodically ask him, right, like you know, uh, Sensei, is there, is there anything you'd like to you'd like to add to this? And repeatedly, he just he laugh. He said, "This is." This is ninjutsu. He's doing he's doing bujinkan. It's all that's all he's doing. It's all footwork. Mm -hmm. Everything he's doing is footwork. He's setting us up. He's using our stuff. And he told he told me at the end that it was that I was going through and systematically breaking down into into a way that people could do it. Stuff that there was guys who were. 10th degree black belts and, and above in the Bujinkan that couldn't do. He said, you went through, he said, you, you're ghost, I call it ghosting people in which going through and creating a situation in which it looks like you can get me. Mm. And I already know what you're going to do because I've, I've shut all the other options down and this one looks like it's a real good one. And so going through and showing him that, and those all footwork is with the use of angles, right? So you can use angles to create distance. And even if I'm a shorter guy than you, if I know how to use my angles, I can touch you, but you can't touch me. So, yeah, that's, that's so key in fighting, right? Angles, uh, knowing how to move, what your footwork is like, and not only in, martial arts but cqb as well it's footwork 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 
So, you know, it, I think to your point, Ace, it's so crucial that we study more of the science behind fighting and not just let me grab him and hit him a bunch. Well, I mean, the, the, the grab him and hit him a bunch, like that'll get you, that'll get you to a certain point. Um, the only thing that I really did with the, with the CQC, with the, with the way that we do the CQC is I put better footwork into it. I use concepts from ninjutsu, um, actually taught people how to hit, um, added, right. Like blended it with some of the stuff that I picked up in wrestling and some of the stuff that, right. Like the tools and the positioning and the, the force generation from the other arts because I wasn't being taught that. And from going through and doing that, I was later to come, I was able, able to later come back and use what I had learned. But when people ask me, my base is Bujinkan Ninjutsu. And if you're a Bujinkan guy, you'll watch what I'm doing and you'll know. Right, you'll be like, oh, that's this, that's this, right? Uh, this is Fubi, this is, you know, Fushicho, this is, this is that. My base is that. But the difference is that I train it in a way that I can use it. Um, and I've gone through and there, there's some of it that's quite honestly hot garbage. It's just dog shit. So, and then there's... This ace. What's um, that? And I don't want to step on any toes, but... What do you think of Hatsumi Sensei? Uh, he's so... So I think that a lot of it at this point is just him seeing what he can get away with. <laughs> right? Like the guy is so old. He, he's, he's dyed his hair purple. And I'm pretty sure like he dyed his, he dyes his hair purple, wears a red t-shirt, and I think he's just walking around doing what he's doing to see if anyone's going to call him on his bullshit. And it's just a, it's just a giant joke to him at this point. Yeah. Um, because I can't see what else it would be. Um, well what's that? I said, well, well put, well put. Well, uh, yeah. Right. Like there's, there's some guys in the Bujinkan that are legitimate badasses. Um, would like legitimate, classify, legitimate badasses. Would we classify Stephen Hayes as one of those? Stephen Hayes trained the Bujinkan briefly in the 80s. Before it was even the Bujinkan. He's not a Bujin. I mean, I know he's a, a black belt, but is he, he, he presents himself as quite the, the expert on the art. Um, would that be accurate to say? Well, let's, let's go through and look at the dynamics of a guru, right? You are here. And you go, you go off away and come back with, with arcane knowledge, right? So we, we can go through and we can look at one of, the, one, of the, one of the instances of a guru that most will be familiar with. Where's Jesus in his teenage years? Right, 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 right. Right? Disappears. He goes east. Yeah. And he come, right? Nobody wants to watch you become the guru. You need to go away and become the guru. You need to go away and bring the arcane knowledge. Or you need to come from afar and move here with that arcane knowledge. So Stephen Hayes' wife is, in, in my opinion, a better martial artist than he is. She, she can actually move fairly well. And like, I, I, like, like she can legitimately move well. Um, but Stephen Hayes, the biggest thing behind him is marketing. Yeah. And he was also one of the first, right? Like there was Boussier, there's, um, there's Dickie VD, there's, there's a few guys, but understand that a huge amount of that was, it was the eighties boom. Yeah. And of the guys that were like badasses that were doing that, a lot of them were, you know, former Vietnam guys who legitimately were scary people and they, just did ninjutsu, but they would be scary no matter what they did. Yeah. Um, it was also one of those things where the way that ninjutsu is being done was extra hard karate. Mm -hmm. And ninjutsu, as I understand it, is a lot more like Sistema when it's done properly. It's a lot more being fluid and relaxed and loose. Well, isn't it true that Back in the old days of the ninja clans and all that stuff and the samurai that 
a lot of these guys would simply study the art of their house. They would, they would study the, the local kind of art of where they were. It wasn't necessarily one art of ninjutsu. It was kind of a bunch of different things. And much like the way our Navy SEALs today would train is, hey, today we're bringing in a Muay Thai guy. Tomorrow we're going to bring in a BJJ guy. Guys, train with this guy. See what you can learn. Let's mix it up and, you know, let's find the most effective stuff so that when you need to kill a guy, you can kill him well. Yeah, so like there's – so as far as the, the history of ninjutsu, uh, what I'll qualify my statements with were I wasn't there, <laughs> right? So I don't know 100%. But from the way I understand it and your comment, right? Make sure you put, put guy talk shit about ninjutsu and watch your comment section blows up. But there was some of it, right? Like, so there was guys that were samurai and they were well-trained as that, but due to the confines of Bushido would don black garb and they would go and cheat and, you know, do things that was, against that code because it was effective um that there was you know disgraced samurai or ronin that wound up saying uh you know what i just kind of had enough kind of the equivalent of a veteran comes back and uh disheartened and just goes up to the mountains and winds up hanging out with some of the natives the inu and uh a combination of his fighting arts Right, which were passed down and were combined with some dirty tricks and some uh, some local alchemy and medicine and stuff like that, like extracting poisons from spiders and millipedes and stuff like that, centipedes, things like that. So, yes, right. There was there was multiple clans, there was multiple regions, right? They they tend to talk about the, the two main prefectures where it occupied was Ika and Koga, mm. but it was it was one of those things where it's not that there was just one type of group that was doing ninjutsu. Right. Yeah, like they, yeah, yeah. like, in, it's not like it was, you know, these warrior priests up in the, yeah. up in the mountains that were, that were doing, you know, this, this work to, to guide things. Uh, they were, they were essentially a mercenary class and they were, they were assassins, not, not much different than, uh, than the way the th uh, the thuggy were used, or even up in uh, uh, in Persia, um, modern day Iran, in the north, I believe it is. There's a mountain range, and the or the first assassinations, or the, the the kind of guy that made assassination famous was a cult leader there that they referred to as the Man in the Mountain, mm -hmm. and he would go through and dispatch his assassins and assassination is kind of this weird topic because it's seen as, you know, it's cold blooded murder and all that, but it's actually an act of mercy because if with assassination used properly by me taking the life of one, two or a few, I can save the lives of in those days, literally tens of thousands of people. Yeah. Right by changing the succession. So the, 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 the ninja were a mercenary class. They worked and did things that were in their own interest. Sometimes, uh, sometimes they were a samurai. And I mean, quite frankly, samurai are a mercenary class. Yeah. Right. Um, they were slaves that had weapons, but they were property of the shogun or whoever they were working for. And they would go and if they were told to kill people, they killed people. If they were told to dress up in black, go at night and stab someone in the asshole. <laughs> right. Um, to go through and do hit and run, hit and run attacks and all that. Sure. Right. Um, that's what you would do. So there was probably a bit of everything. Um, Women, women are very effective. Uh, were were utilized for intelligence gathering more than uh, more than men. Yeah, the, the activity that uh, that women would do in intelligence gathering would be quite a bit more because guys uh, guys tend to get loose in the lips when uh, they're trying to impress a broad. Ain't that the freaking truth, man? Ain't that the truth? Well, yeah, back yeah. then they just thought that they weren't smart, <laughs> and and it's, so they uh, uh, they were a little looser than they should have been. Well, you know, it's it's always been the case, and it still is today. 
that women are <laughs> some of the most infect, uh, effective intelligence gatherers uh, that there is, it, you know, especially when you're, I mean, and this brings us into a whole other topic here, which I meant to get into with you today, as far as seduction and the whole way that connects to trade craft and espionage and everything like that. But suffice to say for right now, man, it really, it's seduction is one of those things um, and game, I guess you could say uh, you can learn it, but in many cases you either have it or you don't. Right. And women just typically have it and they have a huge advantage over men at being able to kind of use their words, use their, their way of things, their femininity to, uh, to really get, get guys and even girls for that matter talking. Well, I mean, they're, they're practicing psychological operations in the sandbox while you and I were playing King of the Hill. You know? Right. Right. No, a hundred percent. Um, yeah, the, uh, women are a lot more predisposed to being able to be cunning. Um, because as a, as a man, you're, uh, typically, or sorry, you're more likely to at least try to, or able to get things via brute force, um, where, yeah. And, and I mean, the other side is most, most guys are just thirsty. So <laughs> yeah. if, if you're the only woman around as, uh, as we like to say, right. A, uh, a two in the city is a 10 in the bush. <laughs> That's good. I haven't right? heard that before. <laughs> right? Like they're, they're, they're all tens after two, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I like what you just said about, um, I like what you just said that most guys are very thirsty and it's, it's the fucking case. And that's, I, I think that's why it, it can be so easy to get a man to divulge information. Even if that man was trained uh, to be aware of that type of ploy, that type of uh, attack, so to speak, uh, there's still a lot of guys out there who will run at the lips when they uh, when it comes down to it to impress abroad. Well, I mean, a real good example is where I am right now is Canada's equivalent of Texas. Now we're not in an oil boom right now, but when we were, there was there was gals that would go to the bar, and I mean nothing to look at, go to the bar about one thirty, pick their uh, pick their drunken rig pig. Right. Flirt with them enough to take them home. Guy's thirsty and wants it. Um, whether he wore a condom or she just cut the end off it, he'd be too drunk to know. He'd leave, a, he'd leave a batch of baby batter in her. She'd make sure to get his contact number. And uh, I mean, guy out here working on an, uh, working on an oil rig, right? He's making like longshoreman money. All right. So he's making well in a six figures. And now he's paying child support. So some of these gals would have like kids, you not, you know, five, eight kids, wow. all, with different, all with different dads. And so they were literally just, I mean, in, in total, they, in total, they, they might do a week's worth of work. Wow. And if you're getting 1500 to two grand a month per kid and here child supports tax free. Huh? Right. That's so, uh, wow. it's, it's pretty impressive. Yeah. It's pretty impressive. And I mean, like she, she can't work. Right. So she's also going to be collecting welfare. Wow. Yeah. Damn. Um, so like women are, women are completely able to, to do stuff that is cunning and they're very able to be able to work within systems and in ways at which, Men that fancy themselves to be more intelligent than they are typically get themselves caught in traps. There's also quite a few guys that have been pretty pretty bright that, uh, with uh, a little bit of a little bit too much alcohol and more enthusiasm and standards, wound up finding themselves in a similar pickle. Yeah, I mean you've <laughs> you've really got to be smart about things, but uh, you know no matter how smart you are, alcohol. Tends to tends to dull the senses, right? It's uh, it, it it's one of those things. I I I myself have chosen not to drink. If like I go the rest of my life without drinking, and I would be fine with it. Yeah. 
Um, there's a few exceptions when I'm uh, when I'm down in Mexico with uh, my with my Tio Malo, my evil uncle. Um, I don't have a lot of a choice, <laughs> but I tend to nurse the lightest beer that I can possibly find, which is Tecate Blue, which is like Coors Light, mm. um, because I don't enjoy the taste of beer anyway, uh, and I try to. Uh, I try to drink as little as I possibly can, even though it typically winds up being uh, forced into my hand regularly when I'm there. <laughs> uh, but I mean, some uh, some drink, good food, and good company is uh, is good for the soul. It really is. It really is, bro. I think we've. I mean, we've come full circle. But there's still so much that I, I wanted to talk about with you. But I mean, I I'm gonna have to leave it at this, man. Um, what I'd like to ask you is. If at some point you'd be willing to come back on the program, kind of pick up where we left off, I, I would really enjoy that. A hundred percent. Awesome. Yeah, just, uh, just let me know when hopefully all this stuff clears up and I'll, uh, I'll come and crash on your, uh, crash on your couch and we can do it live. Oh yeah, absolutely. That'd be great, man. And, um, I appreciate, dude, I appreciate your time. And I also appreciate just the good talks, man. Hopefully next time, like you said, we can have some good talks, good food, and uh you know some good drink as well so yeah but uh even even if we can't get uh, get face to face we we can do this anytime you want it was a pleasure Amen. thank you likewise definitely been a pleasure um so just to level off here guys you can find all of aces badass shit at delta and the number two alpha.com again all of his links are going to be down below here in the comment section or in the description don't be afraid to leave a comment. If you got any questions for Ace or me, throw them down there. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, also, definitely check him out on Instagram, Delta to Alpha Design, at Delta to Alpha Design, and on YouTube, Delta to Alpha Design. And that, again, YouTube channel is valuable freaking information. So, I'd I'd love to be able to blow that YouTube channel up. Um, we're uh, we're like we're struggling to break a few hundred uh, few hundred followers. And I, uh, I don't know what the secret sauce on that is. You know, that makes two of us. Uh, I've been on YouTube for a little while now, and uh, it's a slow it's a slow grow, man. But all you guys out there, go ahead, give him a follow. Um, subscribe to his channel. Help Ace out. Let's get this channel blowing up a little bit. Share it with your friends. Um, like I said, it's honestly just good information anyway. So, Ace, I'm going to wrap it up, bro. Thanks one more time again for coming on, and uh, we'll see you next time. Always a pleasure. Guys, until next time, please remember that you are your first and last line of defense, and I will see you on the next Tactical Podcast. <laughs>